Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Raw Spiel, where we keep it real with the whole truth. We have a um, special guest with me on today. It's um, Amara Hall, and today she seems like she wears a, a lot of hats. You know, she's, a, she's just she's just so much. I, I let her. I ain't gonna do no justice. You know, trying to introduce her, so I will um let her you know, introduce herself to you. And she had an interesting. It been over in even Egypt, she had a, a near death experience. You know, if anybody that's you know, been following this broadcast, you know, I'm very always interested in hearing about you know people's you know near death experience and what they see on the other side, what lessons that they learn from there that they can you know teach us. So um Miss Hall, I'm, first of all, thank you for agreeing to come on to you know share your story. And I'm you know, I'm very interested in hearing about your you know, near death experience, what you got out of it. So, yeah, you, you can take this time to tell the people about yourself and, you know, get right into your near death experience that happened in Egypt for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harold. I really, really, truly appreciate um, being with you and your audience. And, you know, I, I was, I often tell this story, and the near death experience, of course, is, is the most transformative experience, but I, I reflect back, my journey actually started when my dad died. I was 35 and I was going through a divorce at the very same time. And I was so stressed out, so exhausted from all of the you know emotional turmoil. I went to my doctor and he diagnosed me with a life-threatening illness. He told me to go home and prepare my affairs, that I was gonna die. And that I would, or I would end up in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And I really hit rock bottom. I've got to tell you, when I thought things couldn't get worse, depressed wasn't even the word to describe it. I didn't think things could get worse, but then I got fired. And mm. I spent the next seven years on a journey exploring healing modalities and alternatives. And I started to appreciate the small things in life. But it was me grappling with this notion of what happens when we die, you know, that I began studying the ancient mystery schools and meditation. And that I all of a sudden had this mysterious urge to go to on a spiritual pilgrimage to Egypt. And it was there that I had a near death experience outside the Valley of the Kings, where all the ancient pharaohs tombs are buried. And that's when I left this world. And coming back to earth was an incredibly daunting experience because I found myself hurling through the vast expanse of the universe and headed towards a familiar small blue planet. And then it was the sound of Arabic voices that lured me like a beacon to my last known location. And it was felt like coming into the body was actually far from easy, smooth sailing, because it felt like I was struggling to put on wet clothes. And the blinding sunlight was piercing and it was painful and it disoriented me. And all the while I was, I was very disoriented. Thank goodness I had my dear friend with me because I had this strange feeling like my body all of a sudden overtook my, my will and I felt like my gut was going to explode. So there I am, right in this very um, rustic <laughs> um, village area. And my friend took care of me until my energy was restored. But then it was the whole time I felt like a brand newborn baby. I felt this incredible bliss and peace and love. But at the same time came with it this absolute clarity that it was surreal and it was disturbing because I started to understand that I was seeing things that other people weren't. These otherworldly beings and mysterious phenomena that you defied you know, explanation. It actually felt like I was stepping into a scene in the cantina scene in Star Wars. You know, it was a strange world of unfamiliar sights and sounds. Mm -hmm. But the real challenge became when I returned to the United States. Because again, I felt like my life was unraveling, falling apart, 
and I, my friends drifted away. And once again, I got fired from a six figure job. And that's when I went on a quest to find out what happened to me. Where did I go that day? Something was different. I was different. So I went to about a dozen different psychics, mystics, and healers, and they all told me something different. So for me, I, that really for, angered me, quite honestly, it ticked me off until I found a healer that told me I had stuck energy. So then that, that made perfect sense. It gave me hope and it gave me something to do to process. And he told me, he said, your anger, your anxiety, your depression is all because you have stuck energy. So I went on that healing journey and it wasn't until I found myself on a massage table about nine months later, continually, I kept, I was on this quest, like, where did I go? What happened? How come I didn't, if I died, how come I didn't see the tunnel or this divine being Jesus? And so it wasn't there that I actually had an out of body experience. And that's when I was given a vast expanse, awe-inspiring tour of the all. And I was told I couldn't stay and that I was, I stepped into what I called the fabric of all creation. It was like a moving kaleidoscope of color and light. And my guides told me it was love and love was the fabric of all creation. And then it showed me, and I actually saw the actual energy that powers the universe. I didn't have words for it today, but I now understand it's the quantum field. It's how everything is created. And that's when I saw my life review, but only my life review was, it showed to me like a timeline where my emotions had been stuck. And that was what's creating my dis-ease, my dysfunction and destruction of my dreams, of my goals, of my health and my wealth. And um, that I understood then that we are energetic beings and we come here to learn how to manage that what we are, to learn who and what we are. Why are we here? We're, we're here to create. We're here to create what we desire and to have these experiences and lessons along the way. And so from that day forward, I, the last 23 years now, I have been teaching other people how to heal themselves through these energetic tools and techniques and how to step into their own superpower. Because that day, as I said, I became different. My psychic abilities turned on, my natural healing abilities turned on. Um, and that's where I spent about nine months to a year actually refining and healing myself. Because when I went to learn how to do that, I had no intention of doing this professionally or continuing. And so the joke is on me. <laughs> So that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this Tim, how how did you wind up in that near death experience? What what do you remember like oh, what yeah. you, you want to know the real juice, right? How did I <laughs> flip out of my body? Well, here's the deal. I was making jewelry at the time. Okay, I had this amazing spiritual tour um, that was in, incredibly powerful. We would meditate in various temples. We, you know, I would hear angels, like I thought they were angels. I, there could have been the mystics of the temples from ancient times. I was hearing and seeing things in just the normal every day, uh, you know, of our tour. But after the tour, I extended my stay. So I went back from Cairo to Luxor, out just outside the Valley of the Kings. And I was visiting with my friend and I wanted to buy some beads for the jewelry that I made. I wanted to incorporate some, let's say, antiquities into my precious jewelry. So the very last day, the second last day, I found these beads. And you see, in Egypt, these houses are perched on the back of a mountain. And everybody's home, <laughs> the back wall touches the mountain, right? So they're mm -hmm. digging in the mountain for treasures or for tombs or for, you know, buried treasures. And they would cover the back wall with a 
carpet. That's how I knew that there were there were probably going to be treasures in somebody's hands, or they found these little trinkets maybe they'd want to sell. So I went back, I, when I found them, I went back to pay the gentleman, Mohammed. And um, when, when you're buying something there, especially if you're a friend, you sit and you visit. You have a cup of tea, you have a cup of Coca-Cola, they show you their pictures of their babies and their children and their and everybody's cousin, and it goes on and on. It's quite a, a social, you know, event, which is lovely. But for me, they brought out the pot. And I said, thank you. I don't smoke. I don't smoke and I don't, I've, I've tried pot maybe less than half a dozen times and it really never ever did anything to me. Plus, before I had gone to Egypt, I had done a 30 day detox. And the last seven days of my detox was pure juices. So my system was real clear. So um, I refused. I said, no, thank you, politely. But he was just so insulted. And he just blew a gasket. And he's shouting. And you know, it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> so it was quite a commotion. And I was the only female there. So I thought, you know what? I've tried pot before. I'll just you know, um, be polite, be graceful guest here. And, um, you know, I'll be on my way because it never really gave me a high. It didn't give me anything. Right. So the joint went around twice and everybody bounced up, ready to walk out the door. And I couldn't get out of the chair. I found myself standing behind my body and I kept going back and forth into my body. And I thought to myself, and I, I still don't know to this day if I said anything, I must have said something, but I put my hands out in front of my face if I could just get some water, if I could just splash my face, I, I, will, I will snap too. I will keep myself here. And I remember a friend getting close to me and he walked in slow motion and he poured some water in my hands. The whole time I was seeing everybody's, it was like everybody else's life review. I was seeing all of these television sets playing a different movie type thing. And I was trying to stay in my body. I kept finding myself standing behind my body back in, back out, back in. And I thought if I could just splash my face. So the last thought I had was, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> just more worried about how it's going to look in death. <laughs> but yeah, so that day and that from that moment forward, I don't remember. And so until I started coming back into my body, but they told me that I stiffened my body on, fell onto the floor. I was sitting in the only chair they had in the room, small plastic garden chair. And I collapsed, I stiffened. They were pounding my chest with all their might with my, my friend said he used his fist. And he said, later he asked me, he says, isn't your chest sore? He goes, I sm just about smashed your, your heart and your ribs, you know, to get your heart pounding. He said, your breathing stopped, your heart stopped. So it was some time later, they, they ended up dragging me out under the arms. They loaded me up outside into a pickup truck, into the cab. And that was their taxi on the West Bank. Okay, it's very primitive. So the people, they had benches in the, in the back of the, the bed. And then people would just jump on, you know, and that would be their taxi ride. But they put me in the front of the cab. My friend was sitting in the middle and I had, they propped me with my head out the window. So I could get oxygen. So they figured that would give me some, some ventilation. And it was hot. It was real hot. It was probably about noon. So um, then that's when I started hurling back to my body. And, and I described what I saw coming back to earth. And the interesting thing is, I remember touching my friends. I couldn't open my eyes. It was incredibly bright and, and painful. And I thought, as my gut was ready to explode, I'm thinking, oh, God you know, where are they taking me? And I, I didn't know what had happened. I, I really was felt, felt utter and total bliss. And my friend started shouting at me in Arabic. And then he realized, oh God, she doesn't understand Arabic. So I've got to speak in English. So he shouted, oh, the hospital, we're taking you to the hospital. And the only thought I had was, oh my God, we're, we're in the village of, 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 the, of the desert the mm. hospital will kill me <laughs> it's going to be so primitive it's you know yeah. and and they were thinking oh my god where how do we find a toilet there was no western toilet 
there was no pl public place they could take me because in that area of where I was, there were just holes in the ground to do that. And so th then that was sort of like the whole comedy of the whole scene is I didn't know what they were thinking and they didn't know what I was, what was happening for me. So there's another layer to this because the Arabic culture, a man can't go into a bathroom with a woman. Okay, and here, I didn't know it, but I can't stand. So they had to take me. There was no female around. They had to take me into a bathroom or somewhere to deal with that. And then, <laughs> so it was just, it was one thing after the other that complicated it. And the stress of it was monumental. Yeah, that is something that we were I'm speaking with uh, Mary Hall. She's sharing her near-death experience. When she visited Egypt, uh, when you had your experience, did you come into any like ancient spirits or anything that seemed you know, dark and evil, demonic? So, anybody? so yeah, great question. There's two parts to that. So, the fact that I didn't see that. So, here's the deal. This was before the internet, right? I had yeah. nowhere to really reference this, or you know, I felt a lot of shame because of the pot and because of the situation. When I did speak to a few people, all they said was, oh, you're so, you were, you were really stoned. That must have been some good shit, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that, that didn't sit with me very well because one, I'm not, it doesn't matter if you're a regular, you know, drug user or not. Um, I had, so when I got off the plane in New York that day, let me back up. As I was recovering, on the bed, I started to see this goddess called Sekhmet. She has a lion's face and a female body. And when I would look at the armoire, I would see Sekhmet. And then I continued to look outside the window, the valley, Green Valley Nile and the mountains in the background and the wind, the breeze was fluttering these draperies. And all I kept thinking was, I've got to look outside, that's real. Because when I look straight ahead, that ain't real. So that's when I started seeing these otherworldly beings. And at the same time, I didn't know what was really going on. By the time I got to the airport, my tour guides had extended their stay. They were there in line with me. And I said, who's this lion face with an Egyptian body, a uh, female body? And they said, oh, that's Sekhmet. She's the healer of healers. She was known to all the doctors as the patron saint, so to speak, right? So they would pray to her and she was coming to me and I'm like, well, what the heck is this? One, I didn't know I died. Two, I didn't know that because I had some spiritual and mystical experiences before, I wasn't sure or, or saw a correlation or anything, right? But it wasn't until I got to JFK, got off the jetway and I saw all the people in the airport as walking paper dolls. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I am totally freaked out. I'm totally in, in shock and distress. And I have nobody with me. I had a book with me, but I was reading my book upside down. I just wanted to look at something that was real. I wasn't feel, still physically completely in my body, I don't think. And this would probably 24 hours later, I was still coming back into the body, reintegrating. And so, you know, by the time I got to San Diego, um, that fresh air, when I got off the airplane and that moist air, that seemed to shift. And I stopped seeing people like that. And that's why I went on the hunt to what happened to me. And if I died, how come I didn't get to see no tunnel and Jesus? I got, I was really angry. I got ripped off, right? So, mm -hmm. and I also in my own head said, well, this couldn't have been a real, uh, a real near death experience then. But I'll tell you, I went even as far as I went, had gone back to Egypt another time. And my friend took me to a holy man in the south, in Aswan, where they had the famous dam. And so I asked this holy man, they call him a sheikh, sheikh, and uh, please tell me what happened to me. You know, where did I go? I'm different now. I'm the same person, but I'm different. And he told me, he said, in his words, in his interpretation of Arabic or into, you know, what this phenomena was, he said, you didn't die. 
but you you went very 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 far away yeah so i mean i hung on to those uh, explanations for the longest time until i came across dr uh, deepak chopra's book when i started to understand the things that i was seeing and how i was seeing things i now understand that i can see energy so my the out of body experience gave me a better understanding of of what that energy was and that it is how we create and it permeates absolutely everything we are energy it is everything that we see do think and understanding that that energy is creating the good things in our life it's creating the bad things in our life and that we are sort of the conductor of the orchestra and what what is it that we want to live how do we want to experience it mm -hmm. i struggle every i struggle every single day to get back to that point mm -hmm. i mean i yeah. feel it but it's not the same it's not like you can completely plug in and 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 get it you know, it's, it's one of those things. And I think that's because we're human. We're not supposed to have and hang on to that spiritual knowingness connected to the divine or to the love nonstop. I think that's rare. And, and that's what we're all desiring to get back to that one source. Oh, wow. This, this is something. So, so we saw, <laughs> saw people that we, we um, okay, so paper dolls, but now what's that? Now, you think we're using a, another realm or, the, or were you seeing people on uh, spirit man? Which... What I have figured out or surmised is that I was stuck in a dimension. Oh, cool. I was stuck in that anger, the grief, the despair. And I remember sitting there in Atlanta thinking, oh, shit, am I living in the land of paper dolls? And, and I couldn't quite comprehend that that was my reality also. And I think that next nine months was that time period. Talk about nine months. That's kind of a, you know, the whole gestation time. But perhaps that was that integration that I was experiencing to realize that I don't have to play or live in that realm. And we all are kind of hanging out in fear and limits and you know competition and all of that low vibrational energy is keeping us all keeping humanity stuck so so during this experience did you were you like given any um i guess any any lessons while you was on that side maybe you can that can you know, well, mm -hmm. yeah, in the out of body experience, that's when I started to understand that I'm energy and where I stepped into the fabric of creation. And I didn't know what because literally, it was like stepping into the hall of records. So in that out of body experience, I was shown, first of all, I sort of melted. And then I, I elevated into this sphere of light. And then I was taken, it was almost like in the snap of the fingers into the first spot stop, they told me, the tour of the all was like this, it was a building and it appeared like I immersed into a conference room. And in this conference room, it seemed like a dozen persons. They were all dressed identical. They were dressed kind of like suits with no ties, but they were all the same. And I was sitting at the front and all of a sudden it was like their heads were glowing, filled with light. And the tops of their heads opened up like a teapot. And this beam of light streamed out of their heads into mine. And they told me that whatever I needed to know, I had instant access. And from that moment, it was like a snap of a fingers. I was ushered directly into this massive corridor. It was an infinite hall of doorways. And it wasn't for some time later that I actually said, geez, I think I've just stepped into the hall of records. 
And so call that the Akashic records or call it the hall of records, you know, it's up to you. And I was told I could step into any door and, and, and my choice, but I couldn't stay. And so the first door I stepped into was the door on the right. It was a gold door. And I, I didn't step into it. It was like a vroom, you're in. And that's when it felt like I was in this moving kaleidoscope of color, spinning and moving. And, and all I said was like, I lost sense of who I am or where I am or my identity. And I said, I, wh what is this? And they told me that this was the, the fabric of all creation. This is who you are. And this is what everything is. This is love. So I remember feeling like maybe I was in my mother's womb where you feel safe, you feel warm, you feel, you know, everything is just perfect. And then boom, it was like I was rudely knocked out of that space. <laughs> I remember thinking, well, geez, oh, that was, I wanted to stay. And then they, they, they kept saying, you can't stay. And they, they knew that, right? They, they knew that we as humans or our spirit doesn't want to be here in the hard stuff doing this life experience in 3D. So then I went out to the middle of the corridor and I walked directly across and I walked into a pink door. And as I merged through the door, I stepped into what was like a green, solid green emerald. It was opaque. It was very still. There was no movement. And I asked, where am I? And they explained, and that's when I saw my life review. They showed me that I was creating the dysfunction in my life with my emotions, where they had been stuck in my life on issues, on a belief perhaps, or all my emotions, how those had directed the energy to create the experiences I had. And I knew in that moment that I had to go home and I had to detox, detox my mind, detox my emotions and learn about managing. So that was, that was how I found the next phase. Hmm. So speaking of these guys, well, what were they guys, were, were they, um, you know, were they, were they angels? That were the, guys no, it, 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 the best I can describe it is it felt like a light, like an, like an egg shaped light. And they didn't communicate like you and I, it was through thought. It was almost like the thought was in my head and I knew it wasn't me thinking it, right? It was just that that was the telepathic communication. And um, yeah, so whether, you know, it could be argued that it was my higher self guiding me. It could be argued that it was my angel or my guide, but I didn't see it as wings or I didn't see it as Jesus or, or anything like of that nature. It was just a neutral, wasn't a gender associated with it. Um, it was just a neutral um, sense of something that was ascending or um, like masterful, just knowing um, the laws of the universe or, guiding me to where I needed to go. Mm, that is something. No, you was, now you say you took a, um, you were smoking a joint. What, what, what do you, <laughs> I mean, you know what um, Lacey was going to think of, well, I understand, you know, people, you know, and I, I'm not saying, uh, sometimes, and I'm not saying, you know, no drug use or nothing like that, but I know when some people, they may take certain drugs or whatever, that's, that seemed to, I guess, open up, open up something, open, like, like, like a portal, into mm -hmm. the realm. Well, so I wonder what that joint maybe late or something. Or? Well, here's the deal. We're never going to know, right? It was 23 years ago. But what I did do is I, I initially thought I had a heart attack or, or, or I had a heart defect. I mean, that was my first go to. So um, they confirmed that my bleed, my blood, blood, my heart stopped and my breathing stopped. So I had nothing else to go by because I'm sure the hospital wouldn't have had anything more than a, what do you call those uh, heart measures? <laughs> so um, coming back to the States, I had a whole blood test and, and had a whole rundown. And the doctor told me I was low on some amino acids. And he goes, to, he said, Amira, do you understand that more people die of dehydration than you would ever think? And so it could have been the fact that I was dehydrated. 
So that chemical reaction within the pot just knocked me completely out of my body. Um, I am a sensitive to any kind of med, meds, uh, med, you know, prescribed meds or any others. So I know myself, I know I can't really tolerate it. Now, it may have been laced. I don't think so. I think it was just straight pot, but real strong, good Egyptian pot back in the 90s. Okay, that was 1998. So now, um, what was I going to say about the, um, the drugs? Yeah, and other people had said to me, you know, that was great hallucination and blah, 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 but it continued. That was my argument to myself. And, you know, all these years wondering what the hell happened to me, you know, I'm completely different. And the spiritual transformation that I've ex I experienced from that moment. So yeah, my pineal gland was triggered and opened my clairvoyance. In fact, I couldn't go, that the reason why I started to isolate and close down and was depressed when I came home is because I was seeing things that, like I said, other people couldn't see. And I was overwhelmed. I was freaked out and I couldn't go shopping. I couldn't go to the market. So, um, so that's pretty much what happened. And it, you know, there's just so much to talk about here, Harold, but one thing I can tell you over the years as my psychic abilities have opened up and I, 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 my clairvoyance is open, my clairaudience is open, my claircognizance. And this is what I teach people because I believe every single person has these abilities. We come pre-programmed, you know, it's our computer, our software, it's all software. I help people clear their energy channels so that those open. Now, one thing I can say is many people that I've witnessed and worked with, they may have like this one guy that I was recently talking to his name was um, Charlie here where I live and he started having these mental breakdowns and the doctor diagnosed him as bipolar and uh, borderline schizophrenic because he was seeing things and hearing things etc so when we worked together I said to him I said and this guy's probably in his mid-50s I said I see drugs I see drug energy and I don't know how I see it, Harold, but I can just see where the energy centers get damaged. And sometimes those portals get too wide open. And that's when, like me, I was probably channeling everything and stuck on another dimension. And I had to work to close it down. But some people that have done damage to their energy field or their chakras um, by doing extensive drugs, they are screwed. You know, it, it, it can only be fixed so far in most cases. So in his case, his, his, his chakras, his channels were wide open. And uh, then he, he, we, it's almost like a, a muscle or a sphincter, you know, they close and um, certain vibrations we can control unconsciously. And if that's sort of ripped open, it's like a hole or a tear away tear. Um, and there's like a perpetual, you know, ro uh, rotating door. And these beings will come in and they haunt people. And it's no difference with a haunted house or, um, or you know, a doll that's possessed. There's portals and nothing is inanimate, right? We think a stone or these glasses or this desk are solid. They're not. They're energies. So things can permeate them and hook onto them and manipulate them. Oh, speaking with um, <clears throat> Mary Hall is sharing her near death experience and you know and things what's going on on the other side and and yeah if you don't mind if you can touch on you know like these um, give me one minute like um, death bed visions um, you know some sometimes people say that I know recently I saw a video of a lady. She was well. She passed on. She was like ninety-seven, but her her granddaughter was saying that uh, since she was she was transitioning, and she just kept calling for her mother, mm -hmm. you know, things of that nature. So, so, so she was pretty much in a state where you were like um, not quite, but on on the way of transitioning out of here, but was able to, I guess. See what she thought was her mother. 
Right. Um, well, I think what happens is the veil is thinning and, and you don't even have to be on your deathbed to see um, our loved ones on the other side. I think more and more people, their own abilities to see, like I was talking about, is as we clear energy and also the energy on the planet and the universe is shifting right now. So many more people are starting to see things and know things and telepathically receive messages they don't know, they don't understand. And I've been saying this for probably 10 years now, people are going to freak out because they won't know how to manage it. Kind of like me, where I was when I first started, I had to learn how to manage it. We can shut it down and we can open it up. We can also learn to manage it and use it like a smartphone, duh. You know, we can we can have all of that information within ourselves. Um, but, you know, I remember a dear friend of mine, he was actually on his deathbed, he was dying of AIDS. And his sister and I were together, he was at hospice and we knew the time was close. And the hospice care worker called us and we were just in the other room down the hall. And literally, so he was getting ready, she called us, we came running down, and he had just left. He just took his last breath as we walked through the door. So my friend was grieving over her brother, and I was standing at the foot of the bed. And I literally had this vision. First of all, the light above his bed flashed, and I was just kind of stunned. I was in this very neutral, tranquil place total, total stillness. My mind wasn't racing. I wasn't anything. And literally I saw him. It was like he stepped in, the, in my mind. I saw him step into a cloud and he walked through that cloud and there were all his friends and family cheering for him. And what was really funny is he was gay and he was, he was a makeup artist from Hollywood and he was super, um, conscientious about how he dressed and he had this gray uh, gray it was a camel um camel colored cashmere jacket like he was dressed to the nine right as he was greeting all his friends and he sort of sashayed there into that space and 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 he he looked back and he could see his sister candy grieving over his body and and just like a tug of war like oh i don't want to leave her you know and then he went ah she'll get over it. And, he, and it was totally his personality. He just kept on going, oh, she'll get over it. And when I told her, she just cracked up, you know, in between the tears, she could, she could totally see Brian doing that. So that was really cool. Um, yeah. And it's funny, too, because people say to me, well, how come, you know, my husband isn't communicating with me, or their loved one, their, you know, spouse, um, and usually I find in the initial stages, it's because you're so close to them that there's almost a resistance to the connection of the communication. And that's why having a, a, a spirit medium like myself can help bridge that, that space. But my own um, ex-husband took his own life um, what's that, two and a half years ago now, just at the end of COVID. And... Um, well, I don't know, is it still going on? Some people's minds it is. Anyway, he took his own life. And so it was not only a shock to me, but it was a, it was hard for me. He, w he wasn't messaging. He wasn't coming through like I would connect with somebody's grandmother. And, and, and I thought that was strange. So what I do is when somebody takes their life and, and, it, and they're stuck in this it's, it's a still place. They're not really going anywhere. They don't go to the light. They're just stuck. And so I, I give them a healing and connect them to the Supreme being. And it took time. It was probably a good year. And as he, I don't know, thought out, <laughs> he started realizing, you know, that there was something going on behind sides. By the way, he was agnostic. He didn't believe in God, even though he was raised Catholic. And he had just a lot of stuff go on in his life that he shut it all off, right? So um, actually, surprisingly enough, a couple months ago, I'd just be walking down, you know, my path on my walk. And all of a sudden, I could hear him talking to me. And he was giving me pictures and reminding me of some of the fun stuff that we did together. And it was weird because he sort of had the 
the, the personality of a, of a teenager or somebody in their 20s that was cavalier and nonchalant. It wasn't the guy that was way more serious when I met him. You know, so it was interesting because the, it was almost like his spirit was warming up or waking up and showing me how much he loved me and how much he tried to really please me and where I was being a pain in the ass, right? And so it was, it was a healing for me. It was a healing for him as he was, his spirit was able to communicate with me. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you about this. I, I know you even said he, um, you got spirits out there that can you know, haunt people. So do you think it's, it's, um, it's possible, you know, sometimes, you know, like you said, you know, some people communicating with um, a relative or something that's passed on. How, how would they know that that's not a, no, another spirit that's that's fooling them. That that's the sky that. Well, that's a great question too. And um, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Interesting. All of a sudden, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> <coughs> oh boy, that's that's a sign that somebody's trying to tell me something. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, great, Harold. Um, I, I'll tell you a story with a client that I just was connecting with the other day. And I said, you know, I've got a grandmother here on your mother's side. And she said, well, I didn't know her. And I said, okay. So I just left it at that. And then this woman gave me a letter. It was a card or an envelope. It was sealed. And she just showed me as she was giving her the envelope. And she said, this you'll understand in time. And it'll explain everything. And she said, and I said, it was like she knocked on your door, slipped this little envelope into the mailbox, and then turned around and walked down the steps and walked away. <coughs> spirit often tickles my throat when they're trying to come through or somebody's trying to give me a, a message i think somebody listening to this has somebody that <coughs> they're trying to connect to and they're starting to come through mm -hmm. so what this my client said to me she goes amira she goes we didn't know my mom's mom and we just found out that she had a different birth mother and nobody knew that it was another mother <laughs> that her her adopted mother wasn't her birth mother and she had passed away but they had just found some documents and started to understand and it turns out that her her deceased grandmother was a psychic in san francisco very famous and so she goes it makes perfect sense that she's trying to show me that i'm going to see and understand everything in the right time <coughs> <coughs> Oh boy, I've never had a tickle like this on, on an interview. But yeah, they can haunt us. Back to your, your question is, how do we know? Well, I think first of all, the, the, it's like a chicken or egg thing, but we have to find out and know our own energy. If we don't know if some energy is interfering and causing us issues, then how are we going to know we're haunted? Mm right? Like in my case, I had to clear the dysfunction and the energy that of grief and, and depression and limiting thoughts and beliefs. When I started clearing my energy, it's almost like a filter in a room. You know, if I burn some toast, you can't see it, you can sense it, right? And it's not until I put on the air filter or the air conditioner, open the door and move that energy out that you still can't see Right. And, and so it's like we have to refine ourselves to understand we are energy. When we refine this mechanism, then we'll be like this detector, you know, this little radar device. We'll go, oh, all of a sudden I'm really grumpy. What the hell happened? Some energy just came into me. Whoa. And so that's happening all the time. Haven't you ever 
let's say you, you were in a good mood and then you got on the phone with somebody and they're just, yeah, 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 yeah. And you get off the phone and go, oh man, it feels like someone just poured, you know, some crap all over me, right? And you feel really bad. And that's because they poured their energy on you. And they might've said some nice things, but they had a bad day or it's their mother or their father's energy. And again, it's not to make mom and dads bad or evil, but your energy, Harold, was designed, your soul came into your physical body. Amira's soul came into her body, right? And so my job as a spirit is to understand that it needs to belong in my body and I need to manage or clear out any other energies. But with, when we're born, first thing, all we know is our mother's energy. We think it's us, right? Because we are we are this pure soul of love and light. We come in and we're into this human form and we just match the frequency. We feel the love, we feel the safety, we feel protected. We were born, then we're matching our siblings' energy. We're matched dad's energy. We're programmed. We are, um, we, we, we're literally, um, conditioned all through our life. Don't say this, do this. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes. And you can say this or you can't go here and you can't. And all of the, yes, they're here to guide us and protect us. But what happens when we get puberty? Mm -hmm. We start rebelling. What we're mm -hmm. trying to do is get back to our original essence. We're trying to figure out who that special someone is and to identify that's why you know teenagers dress weird you know dye their hair do you know braids all these things because we're trying to find our own identity that's our spirit calling to us and you know it's not until we get to like 16 or 17 we start to find our voice be our authentic self that's our spirit calling to us to follow a particular path. And so we're, 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 we don't understand, nobody taught us that we're energy beings, but we have to learn to manage it, monitor it, right? So if I'm possessed with somebody, then I'm gonna do bad things, right? Mm -hmm. Or do things that aren't authentically aligned with Amira and vice versa. You know, that's why when we drink or do drugs, what happens is those portals open up and entities and beings, they don't call them spirits for nothing, right? They come mm. in and they go, hoo hoo, Harold's not home, let's party on. Because when you're drinking, your spirit leaves. That's why you feel so good. You don't, you're not attached to the pain. <laughs> so mm. your spirit's hanging out outside your body. And those spirits come in, they go, yeah, this is, this is what it's like to be a human. Let's experience this. And they get us to do stupid things that we regret. <laughs> right? Isn't that sort of the story of what goes on? Yes, I reckon so. <laughs> oh, hey, I tell you, we are um, speaking with um, Mr. Amira Hall. Um, we got one final thing before we um, wrap this up. So, your experiences of, uh, I guess, I guess during your near death experience, um, did you have any glimpse or any knowledge of um, heaven or hell you know, while you was um, out of your body that, that you may recall? The only hell I had was when I e entered into New York to the airport, mm -hmm. and that continued for you know the rest of the day. <clears throat> And actually the nine months I was living in hell until I found out about my energy being stuck. And that, that was the hell. And I think hell is here on earth because when I was out of my body, just the unconditional love and the peace and the bliss and the power that we are as spirits, I, I never felt that there was the demons in our minds or the restrictions and the, the limits and the suffering is, is a result of our lack of awareness and um, lack of ability to manage the energy. 
It's my interpretation. I, I felt like heaven was also a realm of bliss, love, peace, and knowing, and being connected to all. Okay. All right, we um. Uh, Mira Hall, I first of all, I do appreciate you for taking the time out to you know share your share your experience. And um, we got you know, off. You got several books signed, but before we get out of here, could you you want to tell the people how they can get some of your material, uh, how we got a website, or how they may be able to um, get in contact? With you? Absolutely, thank you, Harold. I would like to invite people to visit my website, amirahall.com, and. I think you can put my the URL in the show notes. Um, but it's A M I R A H and then Hall H A L L dot com. And I'd like to invite you if you have some questions or if you'd like to learn about clearing your energy, you know, I, I accept calls. So you can book a, a call with me. You can get my book books all on Amazon, Manifesting Miracles 101. Is, is the guidebook that I use for mentoring my clients. And I have a book called Love Up Your Life that gives you steps to creating love in your life, whether it's a love relationship or just loving yourself, everything in between. So those are the, the two highlights. And uh, the latest one was the Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. I've got a YouTube channel. You can check me out at Amira Hall. And I'm live all weekday, every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So love to see you there. All right, y'all. Oh, you want to say something else? I wanted to give a gift. I wanted to give a gift called Stress Buster. It's a guided visualization to help people start to clear out those energy blocks. You don't have to know where they are. Or you can be just feeling like something's not working and it's, and you go to www.amirahall.com forward slash stress, S-T-R-E-S and S as in Sam, dash buster, B-U-S-T-E-R. So you can, it's like an energy shower and just start feeling good no matter where you're at and what's going on. We all need it these days. Oh, yes. I'm, again, I want to um, thank Amira Hall for joining me today and you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge of your experience of what happened on the your near-death experience. And again, I thank you for tuning in. And those of you that's, um, that may be listening to this in the future or whatever, I hope you got some out of it. Um, till then, till next time, God bless you all. <laughs>